of this series, the vital approach. The main problem of our materia medica is that there are so many remedies. Even when using the best software, it often seems as if there are always a few remedies covering the pattern of our patient if we take the totality of the symptoms into account. However, in the last decades, homeopaths have worked hard to come to a manageable and workable classification of sim symptoms in kingdoms and miasms. These systems provide a filter to narrow down selection as much as possible. In this session, we will explain which classifications <coughs> in kingdoms and miasms have been worked out and how they can be used to your advantage in prescribing. Enjoy this session. Well, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> They're not completely new because the old masters, like Yuri already, wrote that we should group our remedies or categorize them in bigger groups in order to manage them somehow. And more recently, Roger Morrison um, gave uh, seminars to explain or to tell us about, to teach us about the compound remedies, how we could understand and remember the characteristics of one part of the compound as a general feature of this group, like the calis or the natriums or the, the halogens or um, the magnesiums. And we had group characteristics of the acids, for instance. So there was an attempt already to... Um, to group some remedies in order to remember them more easily. But that's the no part of my answer. The yes part is, it is new, because the concept as we understand it now actually isn't, I think, much older than maybe two decades. I think in, in the 90s, um, Sankran and Scholten and even maybe some more homeopaths probably caught the idea that was somewhere in the air eh, of the uh, categorizing our vast data and a vast catalog of remedies into larger groups. So it must have been in the air, it was a kind of necessity and maybe it's a general evolution in the scientific field where you first observe, collect your data and then later try to find the, the common characteristics and to group them. And I think this is the, the uh, stage in homeopathy that we enter now. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how it originated mm -hmm. and how did it develop this concept? Well, probably the first and always the first thing to uh, start a new idea is to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And I think Sankar and Scott maybe at the same time somehow had the idea or the question, the premise, the hypothesis, are remedies that belonging that are belonging to a group outside of homeopathy, uh, belong to the same group or have group characteristics within homeopathy. And the easiest way to um, explore this was with the mineral remedies or the elements, because we have a lot of classical polycrests that are well proven, have thousands of symptoms, we know to our despair, eh? and um, that are here and there um, represented on the periodic table. So we can, um, we can start from there and to see that, or ask ourselves if remedies who are in close vicinity of each other, do they have similar characteristics? So Sankara gave seminars, I think, in the middle of the 90s about the uh, precious metals like platina and aurum and argentrum and palladium all close together in the middle of the periodic table near each other and under each other and he could somehow see extract common characteristics and then the next step was what about the other metals are there general characteristics that all metal remedies uh, uh, share for instance, uh, in the same way like we can see in the halogens, because they are, they are sharing the uh, same characteristics. And 
So this hypothesis was checked and the answer was yes. We could find, we could see in uh, the, the rubrics and in the data that we have of these remedies that they are represented in the same groups. And of course we have um, the, the opportunity with the software we have now and it's developed in the early 90s to do quick searches and this helped the development of the homeopathy enormously. Mm -hmm. So that's how these uh, kingdoms actually came about. And mm -hmm. on the schedules, I can see that there are channel kingdom features. Can you explain these features? Yes. Sure. So it started with the idea uh, and with the necessity and with the possibility uh, to do quick searches in our data. So the evolution was quick then, because once you could see these common characteristics, then you could uh, explore the other kingdoms. The mineral kingdom was the easiest because you have a periodic table and it's quite limited. And uh, then the next question, of course, is what about the other, let's say, large kingdoms like the plants? Do all the plants have general characteristics? Can we find general characteristics to all animal remedies? And, and the others, eh? Monera and fungi and imponderables. So, that's how it evolved. We saw, or they saw, let's say, general characteristics uh, belonging to the big kingdoms. Later, this is a work in progress, but I already told you, later this needs to be um, fine-tuned and, and to be explored more, because if you, if you know that your patient needs a remedy from a particular kingdom, uh, it's, it's limiting your choice, but still you have a vast number of possibilities. Let's say you need an animal remedy. Mm -hmm. You still have a lot of possibilities. Or you need a plant. The majority of our remedies are plant remedies. You're still left with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of possibilities. But it is a help because at least you know in which direction you have to continue in your uh, analysis or the way you listen to your patient will change. So I gave in this, indeed, in this scheme, some general characteristics of uh, the main kingdoms. So can you um, explain, for instance, the mineral kingdoms um, about these channel features? Sure. So in the mineral kingdom, the basic experience, the vital experience, I would call it this way, is an experience of emptiness. And it's common to all elements. We call it minerals, I will say minerals, but you know, in fact I mean all the elements on the periodic table, whether it's a single element or it's a compound element, we will call them minerals from now on. So the mineral basic experience is of an existential emptiness. It's not the emptiness of the level 2, we talked about level 2 in our introduction, and uh, this emptiness, the level 2 and emptiness, is like a feeling drained of energy. And some people like this, that's why they uh, exercise and afterwards they feel healthy, on a healthy way, tired. And that's, they feel empty, but it means their head is empty because their body was working. It's not that kind of emptiness I'm talking about. It's the, this existential emptiness, like I have no meaning in life unless and then you have conditions and you know conditions to be okay is disease you can equal this to disease so the condition to be okay of a mineral remedy is in order to exist i have to base my existence on i make a long sentence now i have only short words on my scheme because i wanted to boil it down to the most essential words but that's the basic feeling. So I need something in order to exist, or I lack something, I miss something in order to exist, or I have something, which is the feeling of the uh, experience of the middle of the periodic table. The missing and the lacking is, let's say, from um, um, column one to column nine. Nine, 10, and 11 are the success. Uh, columns like I have what I need in order to exist, which in itself is a limitation. You have it, but you need to have it. <laughs> so you are not flexible or free to not have it. And then from 11 on, 11 to 18 is I miss something, 
uh, I, I lose something uh, and it's, it's like it's crumbling away, it's falling away it, and I'm without fundament and foundation in order to exist. So this is the whole experience that I wrote here on my schemes. The words that I, I think are more or less waterproof and this comes from a years of clinical experience is the existential, existential emptiness, as I told you, the missing, the feeling complete or incomplete. So the, the urge from, for a mineral remedy, the, the thing they want to uh, obtain is uh, something in order to be complete. So they feel incomplete when they don't have this particular thing or they don't have this foundation. And they will um, complain or their complaints will be expressed as I cannot. Mm? This means I have no, I don't have the capacity to. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm writing that, writing here, lacking capacity. The way they will express I'm unable to, I cannot do. I have no capacity to, and I miss the capacity, lacking basis of foundation. That means on what is your life um, and your whole existence founded? Could be family, could be identity according to the role, could be presti uh, performance, prestige, status, role, which gives a meaning to your life, which gives a purpose to your life, which fills the emptiness. Eh? Um, and so they will ask themselves those questions. Of course, the common to all humans. What am I doing here? Who am I anyway? <laughs> so we all have these issues of identity and building up identity and building up ego and wanting to make a good performance and having our role in society and family. But for a mineral remedy, it is the only issue. or It's the basic issue, whatever is the problem. If they have a blocked nose, then the basic issue will come up. It will threaten their existence. It will threaten their foundation. Um, we all have family, and we all have, because we have parents, <laughs> so, and we all, most of us, have a job. Yeah? And we all have a role in society. So often, if you don't, see the, if you don't perceive the case very clearly, we prescribe a mineral remedy. But that is then based on the actual situation. While what I'm trying to say, the uh, kingdom information, the kingdom features are based on delusions. It's not the real thing, it's not the actual situation, it's as if. Hmm? So the other words that I put in down that I put down here are um, words that are often used, like heavy. So if they have a problem, even a blocked nose, they will say heavy. If you have a problem at school, what is how is your experience? Oh, it's heavy. The problem in itself, the difficulty, is heavy. There's some heaviness in it. It's like they have a heavy. They carry a heavy weight, or they have a heavy burden. Yeah? Another possibility is that they express to feel unstable. Hmm? So it's it's a problem. And what does the problem do with you? But even a blocked nose, yeah? even a frozen shoulder, can be anything. Yeah? It makes them feel unstable, hmm? or they want to find their stability. So, and in all synonyms, depending on language and culture. Yeah? Or they feel they have no support. And again, whatever is the problem. Sometimes it's normal to, to count on support and to have support. But I'm always talking about the feeling, the, the uh, experience that is not explainable, not explicable about the situation by the actual happening. So they feel without support in, in, in a situation where you ask yourself, hmm, support? <laughs> it's not the first thing you would come up with because it doesn't seem to have a, a direct um, um, connotation. So you understand it's a need, a necessity of the patient to have support, to have something to, to have a firm foundation under your feet, to have grip. And they say these things like, I lose grip. I have no grip, I have nothing to hold on. So you understand that's what they want. That makes them feel more comfortable, uh, their condition to be okay is fulfilled. If they have foundation, if they have a grip, if they have solid ground, they have stability, and this is all, of course.
you know, delusional. <laughs> so these are the general uh, features or oh, yeah. words for mineral kingdom. Yes. And you have a um, differentiation between the rows and between the columns. Absolutely, yes. So according to the rows and the columns, you can differentiate what is the issue. What is the issue you need to, to, to found your existence on? And then according to the columns, it is how much of this stability, how much of the foundation you already have gained, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in what um, uh, episode, in what phase are you in establishing this need, or having it, or losing it. Yeah. Yeah. But this phase is not a real phase, but Absolutely it is not. a delusion. Completely delusional. Yeah. <laughs> and that is what makes the case. Yeah. Because if you lose your job and you felt like you lost your job, that is normal. Because if, if there's an actual loss, then in proportion, eh, of course you have your feelings and your thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. It's something you wanted to keep and you lost it. Mm -hmm. eh, but this is all delusional. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so this was about the mineral kingdom and we have a number a few more kingdoms. We have, for instance, the plant kingdom. Mm -hmm. A huge one, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge one. You know, the bulk of our remedies are plant remedies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you go in the classical books, you have Clark 2000, no, 1250 remedies or something. I think over 800 are plants. Mm -hmm. Do we use them? No. Mm -hmm. We use a limited number. Why? A lot of plant remedies are not well proven. They have a, a limited proofing, partial proofing. We have no mind symptoms, we have a few um, physical symptoms, often based on the material doses even. Mm -hmm. So a lot of plant remedies we cannot use or, or we're not familiar with or they're considered as small remedies mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were neglected. Mm -hmm. And other plant remedies are overprescribed. You know, mm -hmm. the Pulsatilla, Ignacia, Staphysagria, those remedies are absolutely overprescribed. And so this kingdom information is so important and such a big step forward because now a lot of all those unknown plants, all those small remedies uh, come into our reach. Because if we see the general features of the kingdom, I will give them to you, and then we can see the general features of the sub-kingdom, then we can use all the family members, which is great. But the general features of the plant kingdom in the scheme again, I tried to boil it down to the absolute waterproof symptoms, the waterproof hints. And I had a little bit of difficulty to specify it and uh, to uh, boil it down to only a few words. You know, Rajan Sankran um, wrote three books about plant sens sensations. The, I absolutely recommend those books because that's basic knowledge. He did a computer search throughout the families and he came with a, a lot of uh, evidence uh, with good cases. So a lot of what I know from Plant uh, Kingdom uh, is um, a result of all his research and his books. And I don't have a scheme, for instance, in my vital approach of plants because I use a scheme that he uh, established so far. In general, I can say from practice, because this is something I have to add, that I can add, is plants have a specific sensitivity. That will be my, my basic idea. In the beginning, when the system was evolving, we had uh, a few concepts that needed to be refined. So we learned in the beginning that minerals are structured. You know that. Eh? Plants are sensitive, animals are competitive. I deliberately left out the word structured for mineral because it makes a lot of, of, it gives rise to a lot of mistakes. As soon as somebody uses the word structure, then our mind goes to mineral. And most often it's used on level three in the storytelling or it's on level four in the delusion. It's very Seldom it is a hint to level five pipe. Why? In our language, in our the way of we, we use language, when somebody says I'm structured, very often he means I'm organized. 
I'm well planned. I have an agenda. I have a journal. I, I have appointments. And it's not that I'm, you know, doing something or waking up in the morning and see what the day will bring. No, because our society isn't like that. Mm -hmm. When you work and there's a lot of demands, you have to be structured and well organized. Or you, you will get fired. You won't get your work done. Doesn't mean you're mineral. <laughs> it only means that society puts these demands on you. So if we say from plants they are sensitive, then we will go wrong because everybody is sensitive. Mm -hmm. Everybody is sensitive in his own way for his own problems. <laughs> and everybody is sensitive to himself, yeah? not necessarily to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it is a specific sensitivity. It's not wrong, the concept is right, plants are sensitive, but they have a specific fixed sensitivity. And it means they experience whatever happens in the same way. And that's specific, that is fixed. Eh? So, this is typical plant. Eh? If they have, for instance, a physical complaint, they will have a particular experience. Let's say it feels, uh, it feels stuck. I can't move, I feel stiff, I'm stuck. Eh? And we think, okay, that's superficial belongs to the pathology. But then later we hear the patient talk about himself in his life and the problem and again the experience of the problem is I feel stuck. I can't move forward. And then we understand it's not only in the physical. There are many ways to experience this physical, particular physical complaint and there are many ways to experience this particular mental complaint but this person experiences it in the same way. It's a bodily sensation and it's a mind sensation in the same word. But very often we will overlook it or disregard it because it's so common. The word is so common. Can be stuck, can be blocked, can be um, injured, uh, can be fragile, can be obstructed. Very common words. Uh, tied uh, and untied, attached. We think it is, it's an emotional uh, uh, thing or, or it's, it's a physical thing even, but it's by the repetition in every situation that we understand it's planned. So whatever they tell, the message in all the stories, and they will tell a lot of stories, uh, will always be the same. Maybe synonyms, but synonyms of the same. And that's why I say we listen to the message in the story. So, because they have this particular limiting experience, or disturbing experience, let's say you feel stuck, it's disturbing, they will, their condition to be okay will be the opposite, of course. Because they don't feel well in this particular limit, limiting, limiting um, situation, they will try, they will aim for the opposite. And this, this very thing that you hear the two opposites without asking is a hint for the plant kingdom. They will, let's say, they feel, they feel cool and they want to feel warm. Okay? But it's not like that. But you will hear this spontaneously. This is what they try not to have hmm? by doing the complete opposite. So the two opposites of uh, of the same sensation will be within the plant. And if you have to ask for it, it's less reliable. So it has to come spontaneously. It can be on different levels. They will feel most likely um, uh, the failed situation in the physical, and they might feel the success situation in their dreams, or the other way around. Yeah? You know, every sensation has different ways of different stages again of uh, presenting itself. You have the sensation itself, okay? you have a way to cope with it, coping up mechanism. If you're successful to cope up with it, that means you're conditioned to be okay or fulfilled. You do what you have to do in order not to feel <laughs> what you feel, hmm? or to avoid what you don't want to feel. This asks for a lot of energy, and uh, as time goes by, and you get drained of this energy, then your coping up mechanism will fail. Mostly that's when you um, produce symptoms and when you go to the homeopath. Yeah? Or you can completely deny and then it's compensated. Then you, you're doing the opposite. Yeah? And mostly the people come to the homeopaths in the failed coping up stage. So 
they want to go back to the former situation where they were successful and not feeling what they feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to say. And mostly this, both these things will be in a consultation. Maybe they will um, talk about the past where they have a, a successful coping up mechanism and, and they want to have it back or they will have dreams or something. So another hint for the plant kingdom is that they um, connect and interact with the environment. And I think you can read in the books that we have a lot of different symptoms, a lot of reactions in plants and a lot of modalities because they react on, on all kinds of external uh, triggers, external and internal actually. So that's why I'm writing on the, uh, the scheme, always reacting to the environment. What is the environment? It's the landscape, it's nature, it's plants, animals and humans. It's everything. <laughs> they relate and react to everything. So mostly plants like to be outside, <laughs> they like to be in the open air, they like to be in nature, and it can be any landscape. They will explain to you. They prefer the sea or they go to the mountains or they want to be in the woods or whatever. They will explain where they feel well. And it's a feeling, it's an experience of, of well-being, of being in contact, interacting. And they will have, uh, very often have green fingers. They will love plants, or they know about plants, or they feel with plants, or animals. And that's again where we go wrong, because they're so reactive to everything. They react before they think. They will react to animals as well, and they will love this animal, and they will be afraid of the other animal, and fascinated by yet another one. But they're plants. <laughs> it's just their reactivity. And so we, we, we shouldn't mistake and not ask too much, like, tell me more about this animal, because then we push them in a certain direction. So the relating is um, common to plants. The, the alertness, mostly they're very lively and alert. Again, a reason why we mistake, we often mistake for animals. And um, um, in case taking, the way, that's context, the way that the uh, consultation evolves in, in plants is by images, examples, anecdotes. Um, there's so much that you can't see the bush for the trees. In, and then you know you're a plant kingdom. <laughs> okay, it seems a quite complicated uh, family, a plant family. It seems so, yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with some hints. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then we, we're left with the animal family? Yes, indeed. So the animal family, mostly it's fun, because very often, very often, not always, you know early in the consultation you're in plant kingdom, an uh, animal kingdom. Uh, the general feature is survival. Hmm? That's what is typical for the animal kingdom. Mm, very often the case will be compensated. Not every animal remedy will be openly violent or aggressive or sexual, as we read in the books, hmm? that when an animal walks in, you know, it's animal charisma. <laughs> that was in the books before, and you were more or less uh, hypnotized, uh, or they were so attractive, and it's it isn't wrong, but it is exaggerated. And not all animals will be so openly mm -hmm. animal-like. A lot of them will be compensated, and even extreme compensated. Mm -hmm. yeah. and we, you know, it's the other extreme of of their feelings. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, what is mostly the first hint in a compensated animal case when it's openly it's simple? Yeah. is that whatever is the problem, hmm, the patient will uh, point to somebody that is mm -hmm. the problem. It's not something. Mm -hmm. Whether, whereas in mineral and in plants, it's me mm -hmm. the problem. Mineral lacks something, I don't have the capacity, I cannot, mm -hmm. but it's I, it's me. In plants, it's my sensitivity. Hmm? Uh, it's not his problem or not her problem, they are shouting or they are rude or whatever, eh? but I can't stand it, I'm too sensitive, I'm too much affected by it. And the plant realizes most often that the problem is my particular sensitivity, because you, you cannot 
always blame the others or the outside world for everything that you feel. For instance, when you have physical complaints, it's not somebody else's fault. In animal case, it's different. It's always somebody else's fault. It's not what is the problem, but who is the problem. And we will give you one anecdote. Of course, when there's a fight and a struggle, it's not um, sure you have an animal remedy because all humans fight. <laughs> we are all human. We all have our quarrels and our difficulties with other people. And we all have our fights. So the fight in itself, the quarrel in itself, the conflict in itself, is not appointed to the animal remedy. But if the, the issue, the main message in the fight is, it's either him or me, only one of us can win, eh, then you have an animal. There's no compromise. There's only a winner and a loser. There's no win-win situation in animal kingdom. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the one at the expense of the other. There's one who is superior and one who is inferior. There's one who is the victim and one who is the aggressor. Yeah? That's in animal kingdom. It's not always open like this, in the open, but you will understand that the patient feels or complains, feels bad because he feels inferior and then he will blame the other to humiliate him, to neglect him, to despise him. It's the other one. It's always the other one. <laughs> Even if you're the victim, it's the other one who victimizes you. Mm -hmm. So the most subtle um, way of telling this is comparison. Eh? And that's why I wrote this. It's comparing yourself to the other. Even with your physical complaint. What is the impact of the physical complaint in an animal remedy? It's making you less, and you can fill in less whatever, less rich, less beautiful, less attractive, less whatever, comparing to somebody else, of course. So that is what the complaint is doing with them. So even I can have, a, let's say, even a life-threatening complaint, they don't care much if it's not in the open, if the other doesn't see it, if they can hide it, and if, if it doesn't make them less. They can have a pimple and they will complain a lot because everybody can see they're less beautiful. They have less chances eh, compared to the other in whatever, in their delusion is the, the rat race or the competition or the survival, eh, because that's in their, in their ID. So if there's a dispute, if there's a conflict, it's a matter of life and death. That's you, you will want to revenge the other who did something to you, or even want to kill them. They don't always do it, but they will tell you that what they want to do with the other one, <laughs> who they fight with, is, and then you have a lot of synonyms, but it comes down to kill them. It's finish them off, it's strangle them, it's, I don't know, throw them off a cliff, <laughs> it's cut them into pieces, it's slaughter them, whatever word they have, but it's extinguish them for one and once and for all, get rid of them. And if they don't say it, let's say in their wake state, then they will dream about it. They will kill about they will dream about killing somebody, putting a knife in somebody's back, shooting at somebody, put, cutting them into pieces, or all these things will happen to them. Mm -hmm. They will be killed or they will kill. And it's not dying, it's killing. <laughs> Let that be clear. Devouring. <laughs> there must be blood. <laughs> if not in the conscious mind, then in the unconscious mind. So, depending on whether you have to do with an aggressor or a victim, there will be the aggression, uh, and the, the power, the authority, uh, being the, the best and the first, or the victim. And then there will be more the threats and the danger, and the fear, and the hiding, and the escaping, depending on which kind of animal you have. But there will be this, um, still this polarity, him or me. Mm -hmm. So even if you want to hide, it's because there's a danger to your life, somebody wants to kill you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can like, um, summarize these three kingdoms like Middle Kingdom and Lack. Yeah. yeah. Uh, plant kingdom I react to, yeah. and animal kingdom he or me, or she or me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or inferior simple, yeah. yeah. So that leaves us with the monarch kingdom. 
Yes, the Mother Kingdom, that's a whole different story because first I have to tell you something about Maya since then. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Maya, as you see on the scheme, um, there are a, uh, say a keyword with every Mayasin, and these are based on the Mayasin theory of Sankaran, again. Um, he came with a basic delusion, we, we talked about this, uh, say 10, 15 years ago, and his insight, which I thought was genial, was if disease is delusion and awareness is cure, as he said, then a classification of diseases equals a classification of miasms. It's simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's logical and it's simple. So in his idea, what we needed to do was classify the delusions and then we have a classification of miasms. And he did a search. It is not based on uh, only an idea. He, ch he checked his idea by computer search throughout all the data we have in our repertories. And what he found was that Remedies that are known to belong to uh, a particular, or are prescribed for a particular disease, have common symptoms. For instance, a uh, lot of remedies we know for typhoid fever, like um, Lymphobica and Bryonia and Restox. And if you go through the mind section, then you find that they have common delusions, which is was unexpected at that time. Or they have common features, common mind symptoms, for instance. Um, the delusion that their bed was sinking, for mm -hmm. instance, or um, the delusion that they are away from home. You know, this from Bryonia, eh? mm -hmm. delusion away from home, wants to go home. Or they have uh, homesickness. Mm -hmm. If you are homesick, like capsicum, which is again a type of remedy, then you have to have the delusion you're not at home, otherwise you're not homesick. So he saw that remedies that we know are uh, prescribed for cancer, and you do a search, that they have common symptoms uh, in the delusion section. And that's how he developed this idea of uh, delusions, of classification of delusion equals classification of disease and the other way around. Now, what are the, these features or these delusions, eh, these miasmatic delusions, according to Sankara? I thought this idea is very um, practical, that's why I put it in the scheme on the first uh, page, because it's of a lot uh, it's of, uh, um, let's say, practical uh, use in your case taking and your analysis. He, um, he, he took off with the known remit, with the known miasms. His understanding of the miasms, the meaning that he gave to it, is different. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit maybe a bit confusing that we use the same term, the terminology is the same, but um, the meaning of the word changed throughout time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's not meant physically in Sankara's case. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Or pathologically. <laughs> not at all. Mm -hmm. And miasms, as we studied it, and classical Hanumanian miasms are mostly to be understood as constitutional weaknesses. Yeah. So the psora, the psychosis, and the syphilis from uh, Hahnemann, the, the three basic, the only basis of chronic diseases in his idea, yeah, have a constitutional, um, mostly constitutional, physical, uh, uh, how to say, characteristics. Later, the South American Hahnemannian homeopaths deducted mind symptoms from the physical, from the way the physical constitutional uh, reacts, they deduct the reaction on the mind. But it's not quite the same as Sankara. So the word is the same, the, the feeling is different. Let's say the Hanumanian miasms, as far as I understand, is level two, is uh, disturbances of the etheric body, the energy body. So it is, in my understanding, physical mainly physical. Of course it has repercussions on the other levels, but the levels are interacting, eh? that's why they're um, uh, made like Russian dolls, like it's the one in the other. It's not the envelopes or not the shells of an onion, 
It's more like the one contains the other. The one subtle body contains the other. So, I th as far as I understand, the energetic body uh, can be disturbed, the energy level can be disturbed, and then we'll have repercussions on, on the mind, of course. So that's more the Hanumanian interpretation. And then I can see there are only three basic disturbances in the distribution, the amount or the nature of the energy. In the distribution will be psychosis, in the amount will be Sora, eh? and in the nature of the energy will equal syphilitic miasm. Hmm? But Sankaran is a whole different story altogether. It is a coping up mechanism of the delusion, of the way you perceive the world and yourself, which is the basic delusion. So, he's, he took off with the three classical ones, but he took the acute miasm also as a chronic coping up mechanism, how funny as it may sound. Mm -hmm. In uh, Hahnemann's uh, classification of disease, we have the division between acute and chronic, you know mm -hmm. that. So in the acute, he um, he determines three different possible acutes. Is the real acute? Mm -hmm. It's the epidemic acute, and it's the epidemic acute that you can only have one time. So that's the childhood disease, as we say, and you have immunity for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And then you have the chronic diseases. We know that's another chapter altogether, and you have then the. Um, Unreal chronic diseases, which are uh, a result of lifestyle or allopathic treatment, mm -hmm. or the real chronic diseases, uh, Sora, psychosis, and syphilis. That's the Hahnemannian uh, classification of disease. But Sankran said, no, no, acute is a coping up mechanism, so that's also a chronic way of acting. And then, by this time, there were more uh, miasms developed by the uh, homeopaths after Hahnemann. So they saw the tubercular myosin as a combination of the classical ones and the cancer myosin. Combination of sore and syphilis or psychosis and syphilis. So Sankan incorporated the tubercular and the um, uh, cancer myosin as it was already by that time be became a classical myosin. So we have six. We have the three. Hanumanian, we have acute, and then we have the butler and um, cancer myosin. So there were only a few more gaps to fill. <laughs> if you see the scheme, mm -hmm. you see the scheme, the, Han the Sankrat scheme here. So if you go from acute to Sora, you see there's nothing in between. But if you go from psychosis to syphilis, you see there are two myosins in between. So Sankrat's question was, are there other in-between myasins between the big ones? Mm -hmm. And this answer was yes. So he made an in-between, as you can see, between acute and sora, and he called it typhoid myasin. He made an in-between, or he determined an in-between between sora and psychosis, which is ringworm. In-between between, between um, acute and psychosis, which is malaria. And then the two in-betweens, uh, psychosis, syphilis. And then, being Indian, I guess, eh, he determined another one, the leprous myosin, because he felt, and he rightly, uh, he could prove it, felt that the leprous myosin is a myosin on its own. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, combining the characteristics of psychosis and syphilis. Mm -hmm. So we have three possibilities there. This makes them. <laughs> Quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do we differentiate? Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, in fact, it's it's easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you know what to look for, it's easy. If you understand that it is a coping up mechanism, this means it's the way the problem is perceived and thus logically uh, managed. Mm -hmm. That's it. So if you have acute, and it goes from acute to syphilis, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the sequence. If you have, if you are a person in an acute uh, myosin. This means that whatever happens, whatever problem you have, you react in an acute way. We all know what is acute. It's sudden. It's in our books. It's sudden. It comes by surprise. It's like a storm. Mm -hmm. It's not there, and suddenly it's there. And it's mostly very violent. Uh, um, and it ends 
uh, without leaving a trace means or the disease or the problem is or you win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the, these are the typical features of acute. So a, a person who is in an acute myosin will react to everything with panic. Mm -hmm. And panic means you're already shouting mm -hmm. before you actually really look carefully what is the problem. Mm -hmm. You hear a noise and you go shouting. Mm -hmm. yeah? Or you have a telephone call and you jump that high. Mm -hmm. Or you are confronted with um, a dog yeah? and you feel like it's, it's your last moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a lion attacking you. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of life and death, but it's instant death. Mm -hmm. That's acute. Mm -hmm. So it's like somebody would point a, a, a revolver at you and say, you money have your life. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to think. Mm -hmm. Even before you can think this is my last moment, you're already reacting with acute panic. Mm -hmm. And when the problem is over, there's complete rest. When there's no problem, there's no problem in the field. Mm -hmm. So your mind is not, op not occupied with it, your emotions are not occupied, your physique is not occupied, it is acute, flares up, disappears. Mm -hmm. So that's acute. It's simple, it's panic. Mm -hmm. So if somebody uses the word panic, mm -hmm. then your mind goes to acute. Mm -hmm. Whereas typhoid is acute combined with SORA. SORA, if you know, it's a chronic problem. Mm -hmm. From SORA on, the problem is chronic. And uh, it means it doesn't go away by itself. Mm -hmm. That's the Hahnemannian um, interpretation of chronic. So it's there, uh, but the idea is, the feeling is of the patient, if I do an effort, I will overcome my problem. Mm -hmm. So he, he tries all kinds of things. He does all, all kinds of things to overcome the problems. And there are problems of rest. There are moments of rest. There are moments that the person feels now I am at the place of comfort, now I don't have the problem. But when it appears again, then you have to do effort again. Mm -hmm. Since it's chronic, yeah? so it might come again. But it's always hopeful. Mm -hmm. hopeful. I can do something about it. I have a problem, I do something about it. I, I solve the problem and then it's gone. That's the idea. Typhoid is a combination. It's acute, this means it's life-threatening, and I have to do something to overcome the problem. But in typhoid, because it's acute life threatening, you don't have time. You have to do it very quickly. You have to do it now, you have to do it immediately, or it's over. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the pressure of the crisis. And that's why I write crisis in typhoid. It's a situation that needs a solution now, action now. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the feeling of the patient is that they cannot do it by themselves, so they will scream, they will cling, mm -hmm. they will ask somebody for help, and that's why we have all those rubrics like shrieking for help, clinging to anybody, mm -hmm. that's, you know, stramonium, yeah. very typical mm -hmm. um, uh, typhoid remedy. They want it and they want it now. Why? Because their bed is sinking, their boat is sinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so you have to do something very urgently. So these are all the, always the patients who will give you the feeling of crisis and urgency. Mm -hmm. And it's not real, it's them. Uh -huh. yeah. So they call you? No, they call you. <laughs> and they won't let you go on holiday, and they will ask the consultation the quickest as possible. Mm -hmm. And then they will come and they say, I have this eczema for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And you ask yourself, what's the urgency? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because that's their myosin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Sora, I already told you, is overcoming the problem by effort. Mm -hmm. The hopeful, idea that you will overcome the problem by effort. Whereas psychosis, I make a jump now because the others are in between. Mm -hmm. Psychosis is, has the um, conviction, the delusion that the problem is fixed. It's there and it will never leave you. It's unsolvable but it's not fatal. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you have, if your one leg is longer than the other one, mm -hmm. You can live with it, it's not fatal, mm -hmm. but it's insoluble. Your leg will never grow. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. What, the heck, what can you do? You can either deny it, mm -hmm. you can accept it, mm -hmm. you can hide it, you know, you've got high heel shoes, mm -hmm. yeah? or you will just ignore it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you have a, a few possibilities. Accept it, deny it, avoid it, mm -hmm. hide it. That's what a, a psychotic person will do. They will try to solve the problem, but in a way that they will 
try to have some more comfort. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the basic feeling is, what can you do? Mm -hmm. You have to live with it. That's mm -hmm. what the doctor said. This mm -hmm. will never be solved. But it's not fatal. You won't die of it. Mm -hmm. So it's fixed. It's there forever. Eh? Mm -hmm. That means whether there's a trigger or not, whether the problem is there or not, you always have the feeling there's something lacking, something missing, something wrong, mm -hmm. some problem that you cannot solve. And, um, but you don't have to be triggered for it. Mm -hmm. From psychosis on, it's day and night. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's in your mind. Mm -hmm. In between, you have, uh, between Sora and psychosis, you have ringworm. So ringworm has, has the aspects of two. It has the optimistic uh, um, attitude of doing something to solve the problem. And on the other hand, the episodes of resigning. There's nothing I can do about it, I have to live with it. So it is episodes of trying, 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 accepting, trying, 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 accept, accepting. That's ring one. Mm -hmm. And the episodes are episodes. I mean, not in one day, I try mm -hmm. and give up at noon, no, no. It's like you go and see a doctor, you start a therapy, you follow the therapy for a few months, for a half a year, for a year, then you give up. Then for five years you don't do anything, mm -hmm. and then you try something else. Looks like dieting. <laughs> a lot, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you resign to the problem that you regained your weight. Oh well, mm -hmm. I'm more worth than my looks, and nobody cares anyway. Yeah. Until next spring. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have malaria myasm, which is in between acute and psychosis. So it means the psychotic aspect. It's fixed. It's unsolvable. Uh, and the feeling is um, unfortunate to have this problem. There's nothing I can do with it. I'm stuck with it. I'm hindered by it. It's annoying. Why me? And on top of that, they have acute attacks. Mm -hmm. It's bad and then it's even worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the feeling is unfortunate and they feel a bitterness. Like other people don't have that. They feel limited by it. That's the un unfortunate feeling of China, for instance that they are stuck with this problem and, and there's nothing to do about it and bad as it can be, these uh, acute attacks are unsolvable. So they're always complaining. Mm -hmm. That's the action. The feeling is bitterness, why me? The action is complaining and not actually doing something to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. They might do something but they will, stay com they will complain forever. So this, this, this bitterness, mm -hmm. and always talking about their complaints, you know, mm -hmm. I cannot do this, I cannot do that, because they have complaints. And then you have these three um, different coping up mechanisms between psychosis and syphilis. Of mm -hmm. course, syphilis, we know, is destructive. And the feeling in syphilitic miasm is, um, it's fatal, it will kill me, it's completely desperate, there's nothing I can do about it, mm -hmm. and it's unbearable. Mm -hmm. So I cannot, like the psychotic patient, just live with it. Mm -hmm. it. You cannot live with it. It's too bad to live with. It's knowing it's going to be fatal, and whatever you do won't help. Mm -hmm. That's not a very nice situation to be in. Mm -hmm. So the syphilitic patient will maybe do something, or try to do something, because it's so unbearable to not do something, but whatever he does is destructive. So it makes his problem even worse. So that's why we say that syphilitic patients are destructive patients. Of course, their pathology is destructive, but also their actions. So if they have a problem and they, let's say, they want to forget the problem and they use drugs or they go, they drink alcohol, alcohol, they make the problem obviously bigger. For yeah. everybody else, mm -hmm. it's clear that the problem is not solved. And, and of course, they know somewhere that it's not solved, but it's not doable otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have to do something which is no solution, mm -hmm. but it's better than doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So this is a very un unfortunate situation to feel mm -hmm. yourself in. And very often they will, of course, compensate and do the superhuman maximum to not feel this eh? and to do their utter, utter, utter best to not mm -hmm. feel in this situation. Mm -hmm. But then they are trying not to feel what is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's, the more you go to syphilitic myosin, the more it will be compensated because yeah. it's so very, very unpleasant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to be in this actual situation, to be aware of this mm -hmm. desperate mm -hmm. situation. 
so between psychosis and syphilitic, it's not very nice to be in mm -hmm. either because on the one hand it's fixed and insolvable and on the other hand it will kill you in the long run. Yeah. The combination of those two. So it's progressive disease, progressive destructive disease. And of course we can see that in cancer. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. Uh, this, it's potentially fatal. Mm -hmm. And the action is I have to control uh, the chaos, otherwise uh, that's it. So they feel if things go out of control, it's fatal. And the things that go out of control is everything. In a mm -hmm. cancer miasma, it's not my tumor or mm -hmm. my disease, but it's as well my disease. And it can be anything. It can be bladder infection. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a tumor or it doesn't have to be a fatal disease. Mm -hmm. But it is experienced as if as if it could kill them in the long run. Mm -hmm. And the action is, I have to control it, because chaos is, is dead. And so in their general uh, daily life, they will have this need to control. The condition to be okay is that things are in control. Mm -hmm. This is feelings, this is actions, this is whatever they do. Mm -hmm. And the tubercular myosin has a, a bit a different approach. It is control plus. Mm -hmm. Uh, plus the need for change, because the tubercular myosin feels where I am, yeah, if I go on like this, this will kill me, I have to change something. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what, as long as it's changed, as long as it's not staying in the same place, mm -hmm. because the same place will suffocate me. Mm -hmm. And that's why we know tuberculinum as a uh, cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. because he wants to go somewhere else, he goes to many places, he changes places, jobs, relationships, doctors, whatever. We know the changeability mm -hmm. or the need for change of the tubercular uh, patient. Also, the speed, the hectic activity. I have to do it now and I have to do it quickly. Mm -hmm. But it's different than typhoid because it's like a, a candle burning, mm -hmm. uh, two sides, as Fitulka has described very well. It's my, my life is short. Mm -hmm and I have to take action quickly. And they do it day and night, again, without trigger. It doesn't have to be a trigger situation, it's always there. It's an underlying feeling of speediness, of hectic activity, of need for change, of, of otherwise oppression and, and suffocation can't stay here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we you know the tubercular patient was prescribed change of air. If you mm -hmm. live near the sea, you have to go to the mountains. If you live in the mountains, you have to go to the sea. As long as change of air. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then the leprous um, myosin patient has the need for control of cancer, the need uh, for change of, t of tuberculosis and the hectic activity, so the speed. And on top of that, the disgust mm -hmm. of the lepra myosin. So there's a lot of disgust for self. And of course, it's projected in the outside world. So there's uh, a disgust for um, dirt, toilets, uh, the gutter. They will talk of these things. And they will be um, uh, either in their daily life or in their dreams. Will be, this will be a topic. This will be an issue, a spontaneous issue. You don't have to ask for it. And the feeling of the leper is un totally alone. Mm -hmm. so there's nobody nobody to count on. Uh, I'm uh, near death and nobody will help me. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the only one I can count on is myself. Even my nearest and dearest I can't trust. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a very difficult situation to be in. So a patient in the leprous myosin will almost always compensate by overdoing it. Doing a lot of effort in order to be accepted, not even be loved, but be accepted, tolerated mm. yeah, by the others, like a leper, yeah? mm. and, and not um, not being outcasted or dis excluded, because that's what he feels. Mm. Uh, he feels outcasted and excluded. And it's very near syphilitic, it's a very near desperate situation. Yeah. So mostly there will show the other way around, like high performance in order to be uh, accepted, uh, very hygienic in order not to be disgusted by the others, etc. 
So that's the whole miasmatic chart of Sankran. So throughout case taking, we will listen to the problem and then the way the patient manages his problem. Mm -hmm. And this will give us a hint to the miasma. Yeah. And is this miasma important for every Maybe it is, but in my understanding, it's most important for the plant kingdom. Mm -hmm. I tell you why. The, um, there are homeopaths who um, uh, use the mycins in mineral kingdom uh, cases and in animal cases. But as far as I can see, the periodic table has 18 stages. Mm -hmm. And if we use the Sankran mycins, we have 10 mycins. So the 18 stages are even more fine-tuned. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't see in my cases a necessity mm -hmm. to use the myosin in order to determine the remedy because it was already cleared by, by rows and columns. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be more refined by the myosin. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have the myosin information, that's good. Sometimes you don't have it, well, you don't need it. Mm -hmm. So um, very practical, if you don't need it, why give? importance to it. Yeah. It can be maybe for your prognosis, but in general it won't help you to determine the remedy. In animal um, kingdom cases, I found that the myosins that are uh, given to su certain sub-kingdoms belong to the sensation and not to the myosin. And mm -hmm. I think it's, on a, it's, it's a mistake. It's a confusion. Mm -hmm. So it is said that spiders are mostly tubercular myosins, or spiders and insects, and I think it's not the myosins, it's a spider. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a spider feeling of restlessness and activity, etc. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't belong to the myosin. You cannot use the same evidence for both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the first, the, the one part of the vital disturbance is the what, and the other is what you do with it. It's the what and the how. Yeah? And, uh, mammals, for instance, very often are considered to be leprous myosin mm -hmm. uh, remedies, but I think it's a mammal feeling, the feeling of being, the delusion of being despised, we mm -hmm. know, by Lacanina, belongs to mammal. Mm -hmm. It's in all mammals. It's not a leprosy myosin, it's a mammal feeling, mm -hmm. mammal sensation. So again, you cannot use the sensation evidence to determine the myosin, mm -hmm. because if all the members of the same group belong to the same myosin, what is the help? But in plants, that's a difference. Okay. Yeah. If you know the plant family, then the way to determine which plant of the family you need, then you can use the myosins. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's uh, of its biggest value. Mm -hmm. So you started with this myosin to explain a bit about the monarchy. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So what I saw in my cases was that what I considered as no sort cases actually fell apart into groups. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the whole case was nothing else than, or the, the, the basic line was the coping up mechanism. Mm -hmm. The only thing the person told me was change, 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 then mm -hmm. you get to that line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's simple as that. Mm -hmm. Or the person said control, 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 control. Then he get cancerous uh, carcinogen. But Sometimes the basic line was my disease and uh, my physical complaints and, uh, and the doctors I saw and the treatment I had and the food I eat mm -hmm. and so the disease but nothing to do with the coping up mechanism and then I considered this as a different group altogether. This was not, not a plant, not a mineral, mm -hmm. not an animal not a nosode, so then what was it? It seemed to be a nosode because it only was concentrated around the disease. Mm -hmm. But not the coping up mechanism, but the disease itself. The coping up mechanism sometimes was there, sometimes it wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. Like for instance in Fluenzinum, I saw several cases. What is the coping up mechanism? The person doesn't feel well and wants to get rid of his symptoms. But that's normal. Eh? And they see many, many doctors. But that is normal to all people who are chronically ill. Mm -hmm or to most people who are chronically ill, that they have a history since they're born, and maybe now they're 45, mm -hmm. and they never felt well a day in their life. Mm -hmm. So this is the whole case. And then I understood this is not the coping up mechanisms on the front, but this is disease, that's the problem. And then 
it is the, the matter of being healthy, of unhealthy, being a normal or abnormal. Mm -hmm. And then we need other remedies. Then we don't need the, no, the results as we know them in a classical way, like midorhinum mm -hmm. and sorhinum and syphilinum. But then we need the, the pathogen, yeah, the uh, uh, organisms that reflect this disease complex. For instance, as I told you, influenza. Eh? So, and then by these cases, I could extract monera um, characteristics. But that's a lesson that we go in, into details, mm -hmm. but they have their specific kingdom features. And they're completely different than the coping up mechanisms. This session was an introduction into kingdoms and miasms. Of course, the matter is too complex to cover it in one session. It needs a lot of studying the books of Scholten, Sankaran, Klein, Fraser and many others to master these classifications. Later on, we will spend more sessions discussing and fine-tuning the differences between similar plant families, animal suckings and mineral robes and stages. But first, we will go into detail in the next session on how to take a case in order to unearth the vital on every level. Please be there and meet us for this session. See you!